Premier to start Okinawa 50 Years Since Return Symposium entitled Okinawa's Past Half Century and Japan's Future. I'll be serving as the moderator today. My name is Kana Nagamine. I look forward to your kind cooperation. Thank you in advance. Now today, all the panelists and the members of the staff are wearing the formal attire of Okinawa called Kaede Yushiwir, which is a summer official attire. We have a limited number of people on site today in the interest of pre prevention of spread of COVID-19. And today's symposium is being hosted in a hybrid fashion combining both online and on-site. Then, on behalf of the organizer, I would like to invite Mr. Toru Kunimatsu, Director of the Seibu Operations of the Yamiri Shimbu Holdings and the President of the Yamiri Shimbu Seibu to give some opening remarks. Mr. Kunimatsu, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction. Welcome to our symposium. I would like to thank all of you for joining us, despite the very busy schedule. I am so delighted to see such a large audience. On the 15th of this month, Okinawa will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of reversion to Japan. On this anniversary year, Yomiuri Shimbun has been looking back into the half century of uh, Okinawa and uh, had to have an event to think about the future of Okinawa and Japan, and that is uh, the reason for this symposium. Okinawa has walked a history of misery and difficulty. At the end of the Pacific War, there has been a fierce and ferocious battle on land, and with the attack from the U.S. forces, Okinawa has been devastated. And uh, for many, many decades, Okinawa was put under uh, the U.S. Uh, the rule. On the 28th of April 1952, the San Francisco Peace Treaty has entered into force, and the mainland uh, of Japan has reverted its sovereignty. But Okinawa was still under the control of the United States. So the 28th of April, as was reported by Yomiuri last month, is still uh, they're being said to be the day of humiliation. There's even a special class for the April 28th uh, at the schools. On the 15th of May 1972, after 27 years since the end of Second World War, uh, Okinawa has been returned to Japan. And ever since then, for five decades, with tireless efforts, Okinawa has developed until today. In 1972, uh, the number of tourists was 560,000, but in 2019, it has exceeded 10 million. It is on par with Hawaii and as uh, a tourist uh, island. Because of pandemic, the tourists' numbers have come down. But after the pandemic, I'm sure there will be many tourists attracted to Okinawa because of its rich nature and uh, her culture. In the entertainment uh, the business, there are countless numbers of actors and musicians uh, very active. We still have it fresh in our memory of uh, Kiyuna Haryo, or the karate, a gold medalist who won uh, the gold medal uh, at the Olympic Games last year. On the other hand, even after half a century, uh, the U.S. forces in Japan her bases are concentrated in Okinawa, so there is a lot of burden uh, and uh, impact felt by the Okinawa Hata people. Over the issue of the relocation of Tenma uh, Air uh, the Base Facility to Henoko, uh, this has become a big uh, issue. And there are also complicated international uh, developments surrounding uh, Japan and Okinawa. Uh, there are fierce conflict going on between U.S. and China. Uh, the Chinese government vessels uh, are repeating intrusion into our territorial waters. Uh, so there is rising uh, tension over Senkaku Islands as well as Taiwan. 
uh, we can never condone unilateral change of in status quo by her force. And Russia has invaded into her Ukraine, and it has threatened uh, the possible use of uh, nuclear arms, just like North Korea. Uh, we are rethinking of what should be uh, the defense policy going uh, forward. Uh, the long-standing issue is how to further promote Okinawa economy, the per capita uh, gross prefectural income is still hurt to low. Uh, there is so-called strainer economy uh, that uh, the, the profits are taken over uh, by the businesses on uh, the mainland. Uh, and uh, uh, in the recent years, especially uh, for this fiscal year, uh, the budget by the national government uh, to promote Okinawa uh, has been less than 300 billion. So it is not worthy uh, to watch Okinawa, how it will uh, develop. Uh, utilizing its characteristics of being close to Asia. At uh, today's symposium, we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Michael Green, uh, the Senior Vice President of uh, CSIS. He will be speaking on the theme of future of Okinawa and U.S.-Japan relationship for his, his key keynote speech. He has been the Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Head Council under the Bush administration. Then we will have uh, sessions one and two panel discussion respectively on strategic stability in East Asia and Okinawa, as well as development promotion of Okinawa from the 51st year on. We have live streaming of these discussions. Yomiri Shimbun, her group, with the 50th anniversary of reversion of Okinawa, we have many events being planned. For example, in April, we had the professional ball game, the official game by Yomiri uh, Kyojin, uh, the group, at uh, the Okinawa Serura Stadium, uh, the Naha, uh, by uh, the Yomuri Giants. Uh, many uh, local fans have welcomed the Yomuri Giants. And uh, tomorrow, uh, at the 11th, uh, we will have uh, Yomuri Orchestra celebrating the 60th anniversary uh, to have a commemorative concert at uh, the uh, wonderful uh, Naha uh, Cultural uh, art, a uh, theater, and a heart, with Yomiuri Kodomo or Shimbun, as well as Yomiuri Chukose Shimbun, uh, for uh, the primary school as well as high school uh, students. We have special issue on Okinawa. Uh, we also would have started uh, at Tokyo National Museum a special exhibition of Ryukyu commemorating uh, the uh, 50th anniversary. It will also go on to Kyushu uh, National Museum uh, to widely uh, to introduce uh, the history and culture of Okinawa uh, with uh, the largest group uh, in the media at uh, the world, Yomiuri, will continue to report on Okinawa uh, to deepen the understanding of people over Okinawa. Lastly, I would like to thank the Okinawa Association of Corporate Executives, as well as Chamber of Commerce, as well as uh, the Business Managers Association and others who have been supporting us for this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We would I like to start the program. Part one will be keynote speech entitled Future of Okinawa and U.S.-Japan Relationship. The lecturer will be Dr. Michael J. Green, Senior Vice President for Asia Japan Chair and Harry A. Kissinger Chair with CSIS or Center for Strategic and International Studies. He will be joining us from Washington online. The moderator will be served by Ms. Keiko Izuka, who is the senior political writer and editorial writer for the Yomiuri Shimbun. I would like to introduce the translation services once again. As for the earphones to listen to the translation services, please set channel 1 for Japanese and channel 2 for English. Channel 2 is for English. Channel 1 is for Japanese. I would now like to hand over the microphone to Ms. Izuka, the senior political writer and the editorial writer. Ms. Izuka, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I now have the microphone. I am the editorial writer of the Amiri Shimbun. Keiko Izuka is my name. I'll be serving as the moderator today. So without further ado, we're now connected online with, with Washington. And Dr. Michael Green will be providing us with a keynote speech. The, the topic will be future of Okinawa and U.S.-Japan relationship. So. Mike, Mike, Mike has set 
has set the title of the title of geopolitical history 50 years since Okinawa Revolution as the title of his lecture. So he'll be focusing on ge geopolitical history trends, I, I would understand. So that is the title of his presentation. So without further ado, we'd like to invite Dr. Michael Green. Dr. Green, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very, very much uh, indeed, um, Izuka-san. And thank you, Kunimatsu-san, uh, for inviting me to speak on this important commemoration and reflection on 50 years since the reversion of Okinawa to Japanese sovereignty. I was so impressed just now listening to all of the things that Yomiuri Group is doing to commemorate this important anniversary. And it is truly a service not only to the people of Okinawa and Japan, but to the entire world that Yomiuri is using its enormous um, communication power to really um, spotlight um, the importance of Okinawa, the incredible burdens borne by the people of Okinawa for the security of Japan, but indeed for the security of, of the entire Indo-Pacific region. Um, and I hope that from this um, uh, support and sponsorship from Yomiuri, um, that um, Okinawan uh, tourism and business uh, thrives into the future. I know that I look forward to visiting Okinawa again. I'm sorry I can't be there for this occasion, um, but I, I, I hope to be one of the many, many tourists who will take advantage of all of the cultural and uh, natural and historical wonders uh, that make Okinawa such a destination for so many people. Um, I'm a little bit older than Okinawa Reversion itself. Um, I have my own memories of Okinawa Reversion from when I was a small boy because my father was um, sent to Okinawa um, and then uh, to, the, to Vietnam in 1972. Um, he was a Marine Corps officer, uh, but he was also a lawyer and an expert on human rights and an expert on the Geneva Convention and an expert on uh, civil military affairs. And he was actually traveling uh, to Okinawa uh, on his way to Vietnam to investigate um, the treatment of civilians in the Vietnam War by Marines. Um, he was a firm believer in the Marine Corps. His father had been a Marine in World War I, but he was also a human rights lawyer and was committed to improving the Marine Corps' um, doctrine and training to protect civilians. And he came back from Vietnam uh, to Washington. He was only a major, but he went directly to the Commandant of the Marine Corps and insisted that the Marines had to do a better job in Vietnam uh, protecting civilians. And throughout his career as a lawyer, he um, fought for civilians um, who were um, affected by Marine Corps uh, operations in peace and war. Um, now, I was only a small boy at the time of reversion, so I learned all of this about my father's career later. Um, what I remember from being a small boy was that my dad came back from Okinawa and brought me omiyage, uh, which was very exotic and very exciting for me. And of course, for a small boy, it was the first time I had ever heard of uh, the island of Okinawa. And, and in fact, in, in, in those days, uh, 50 years ago, most Americans knew very little about Okinawa. Um, some, of course, remember it as the site of horrific combat and fighting between Japan and the United States at the end of the Second World War. Most Americans, though, didn't know much about Okinawa. But for Okinawans, of course, the memories of the war and the scar from the war in every family ran much, much deeper. Um, I came to really appreciate this myself when I visited Okinawa on uh, the 25th anniversary of reversion. Um, and um, I met with Governor Ota Masahide. We went drinking, of course. Governor Ota liked to drink. And we talked late into the night about the Battle of Okinawa. And of course, uh, Governor Ota was a leading scholar and historian of that, of that horrific and violent uh, battle. We talked about the burden borne by the Okinawan people, about uh, his hope for economic development uh, in Ginoan, but across Okinawa. We debated ideas. Um, I was there uh, working for the Pentagon. Um, uh, 
Uh, I had no authorization to negotiate with Governor Ota, and of course, Governor Ota himself did not really control um, uh, Japanese government policy on uh, U.S. basis of the alliance. But we had a very sincere communication. Uh, we agreed on many points, um, and I admired him enormously. And um, I sometimes worry that today we don't have that same honest, candid, um, solution-oriented communication, uh, not between Tokyo and Naha, uh, not between U.S. military commanders and local officials, not between the U.S. and Japan. Uh, I see increasingly that issues over bases or differences with the government in Tokyo or with the United States are being fought in court or through demonstrations or through public speeches. Um, the geopolitical importance of Okinawa, of course, has never been more important. So it's critical to find a way to maintain deterrence and stability while doing more to address the concerns of the people of Okinawa. And in a way, reflecting on my own father's uh, visit to Okinawa 50 years ago, this was his mission. And I hope that this 50th anniversary and this um, spotlight on the history and the present and the future of Okinawa provided by Yomiuri I hope that this might rekindle the kind of sincere exchange that will allow uh, real progress for the people of Okinawa in terms of their economic uh, and, and social and co cultural and political uh, uh, future, um, while at the same time uh, ensuring that um, the security of Japan and the entire Indo-Pacific uh, is reinforced. So let me use uh, the remainder of my time with you to reflect more on the past 50 years uh, of East Asian geopolitics, of the U.S.-Japan alliance, uh, and of Okinawa's own journey, uh, remarkable economic development, but continuing to struggle with the burden of having 80% of U.S. bases in, in, in the, the smallest prefecture, and, and perhaps suggest some lessons we might draw, and then hear your questions and suggestions, which I look forward to. When reversion was being negotiated over five decades ago, the U.S. military did not believe that sovereignty could be returned to Japan without undermining uh, a military, American military power and deterrence in the Pacific. Indeed, since the early 19th century, American naval officers had wanted what they called stepping stones in the Pacific, forward bases that would lead to an island outpost in the first island chain. Um, Americans had seen Britain secure Hong Kong and Singapore, for example, and with the advent of the steam-powered sailing ship, wanted coaling stations, wanted forward bases. And when Commodore Matthew Perry arrived in 1853 to open Japan to commerce and diplomatic relations, he had no instructions from Washington to establish a military base. But privately, he very much hoped that he could establish a Navy base uh, in the first island chain. One of the places he thought would be a good base was the Ryukyus. Um, in the end, the State Department strongly opposed any such uh, acquisition or annexation. Um, Terry nevertheless hoped that people of the Ryukyus might attack his sailors and Marines and perhaps provide a pretext that would allow him to establish uh, a military base. But what actually happened, of course, was the people of the Ryukyus welcomed Commodore Perry uh, and his um, sailors and marines with open arms and friendship. Um, five decades later, in 1898, when the United States entered a war with Spain, uh, the U.S. did have the pretext to establish bases in the first island chain and the second island chain in the Philippines and in Guam. Um, and as the United States fought bloody island campaigns to reverse uh, Imperial Japan's military conquests and to close in on the home islands to try to end the war in 1944 and 1945. Uh, senior American strategic uh, thinkers uh, like the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernest King, Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal, declared publicly that after the end of the Second World War, the United States must hold island bases in the Pacific, uh, not just in the Philippines, in order to contain Japan in the future, or any other hostile power that might seek to expand again towards Hawaii, Alaska, and the west coast of the United States. 
When the North Koreans attacked South Korea in 1950, uh, this became the core uh, driver of much of American security strategy in the Western Pacific. Um, and the need for forward bases to contain communism, to prevent further attacks on Japan uh, or other uh, democratic states in Asia, it all became obvious to the American people, to the Congress, and to few peoples, few peoples across Northeast Asia. And as many of you are well aware, American bases in Okinawa figured prominently in the Korean War, and then in the Vietnam War, and then in the 1980s, in the efforts of Prime Minister Nakasone Yasuhiro and President Ronald Reagan to block Soviet expansionism past the first island chain. Japan, Nakasone declared, would be an unsinkable aircraft carrier. And indeed, the archipelago of Japan served as a fence that trapped the Soviet Navy inside the Sea of Okhotsk as the US and Japanese militaries strengthened our ability to defend Japan and stop Soviet expansion. So if the US-Japan alliance helped to accelerate the collapse of the Soviet Union, and end the Cold War by blunting Soviet uh, objectives, object, objectives in the Far East, uh, there should be little doubt that US forward military presence, including in Okinawa, played uh, a critical role. But of course, the Japanese public did not really take ownership of the alliance in those days, nor did most Japanese prime ministers. During the Vietnam War, for example, US B-52 bombers operated from Okinawa with a charade of deniability about they were heading, about where they were heading, where they were doing their bombing missions. And the Japanese government and the Conte did not want to know. Um, they did not want to be held accountable for what US uh, B-52s were doing. When Okinawa reversion came before President Richard Nixon, uh, he disagreed with the Pentagon. He did not think that Japanese sovereignty over Okinawa would undermine US military operations or um, US Cold War strategies for containing Soviet expansion. Nixon actually came to office in 1969 with a much more flexible view of American forward military presence. In August 1969, with his Guam Doctrine statement, he urged um, that American allies and partners in Asia take up a greater burden for their own defense. And he said the United States would reduce the burden of US bases would pull back from Southeast Asia, would reduce the overall military presence in, uh, in Japan. Although, of course, uh, primarily in mainland Japan, in Honshu. When Nixon became vice president in 1951, the United States accounted for half of global economic output. By the time he became president in 1969, the US accounted not for half of global economic output, but only 25%. And Nixon wanted to resize American obligations and encourage more efforts by allies to sustain a strategy of containment against communism and expanding the free world. And Nixon thought he had an agreement with Prime Minister Sato Esaku, um, which would essentially be an agreement in which the United States would return Okinawa to Japanese sovereignty. And in exchange, uh, Japan would commit to playing a larger role in the security of Taiwan and Korea and the Far East. And Sato did agree in, in a joint statement with President Nixon to words along those lines in 1969, suggesting that Japan would play a larger role, that Japan had an interest in the security of Taiwan Strait and Korea. But after Okinawa was returned to Japan, the Japanese government ignored that commitment for another 25 years. And it's interesting because Japanese historians and the Japanese media often portrays Tokyo as the victim of American intrigue and gaiatsu and pressure. But in this case, at least, it was Richard Nixon who felt that he had been tricked by Sato Esaku, and he was furious. Sato's alibi policy on Taiwan and Korea, avoiding any involvement or any discussion, or even any interest in what the US would do in a contingency, this alibi policy lasted until the mid-1990s. As the Cold War ended, many Japanese political and business leaders thought that the dilemma of dependence on the United States for security, and with that, the need for US bases in Japan might end. Uh, it appeared, as the Cold War was coming to a close, 
that the new currency for geopolitics would be economics rather than military prowess. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of China as a commercial player, uh, Japan found itself not positioned to secure its own destiny, uh, not to be a power broker between the US and China, but instead to be the victim of Chinese ambitions. And China had its own ambitions. Beijing, at the end of the Cold War, saw Japan as an incomplete and in many ways illegitimate power. Where Japan had only economic sway, China, according to Beijing, would be able to wield growing economic and military power both in Asia. After a century of shame at the hands of the Western and imperial powers, China would reemerge as the central hegemonic power in Asia. These ideas, these ideas are very powerful today in Xi Jinping's China. But the first hint, the first inklings of Chinese ambitions became apparent uh, on the 25th anniversary of reversion in 1995, 96, and 97, when China conducted a series of nuclear tests despite international protests, particularly from Japan, and when China provoked a major crisis in the Taiwan Strait by conducting live fire military exercises all around Taiwan, uh, <coughs> including missiles that struck um, quite close to islands near Okinawa. So the idea that somehow the end of the Cold War would bring an end to geopolitics was proven wrong. At the time, in, in the mid-1990s, I had just completed my own doctoral degree, and I was uh, advising the Pentagon on how to rebuild the US-Japan alliance in the post-Cold War context. Um, what actually prompted uh, Pentagon officials like Joe Nye and Kurt Campbell to reach out to me was the sense that the United States and Japan were adrift, that the alliance was, was coming apart after the Cold War. <clears throat> and even before the Taiwan Strait crisis, the brutal rape of a young Okinawan girl in 1995 created a real panic in Japan uh, and Tokyo and the government and in Washington. For the first time, a majority of the Japanese public in opinion polls questioned the need for US bases as the story of this rape horrified readers across the mainland and of course also in the United States. The US embassy was reeling. Washington could not get a clear picture of what was happening. And though I was still a fairly young uh, academic, um, I was asked by the Pentagon to go to Japan to see if I could understand what was happening. I met with political leaders from all the major power parties including the Socialist Party and with political leaders from Okinawa, I reported back to Washington that support for US bases in Okinawa was actually deeper than polls revealed, but that the Clinton administration at the time simply could not be complacent and could not ignore the mounting frustration uh, of the Okinawan people. Um, I cannot claim that the SACO plan to move um, out of Marine Corps Air Station Futema was my idea. It really wasn't. But I certainly did come to understand the need for such an initiative and the need to reduce the footprint of the US military and the burden placed on the people of Okinawa. And so in the late 1990s, the need to recalibrate the US-Japan alliance, uh, to try again to increase Japan's contribution to regional security while reducing as much as possible the burden of US bases. This this recalibration of the alliance took central stage in the US-Japan alliance. And the SACO process and subsequent initiatives did, in fact, uh, reduce the footprint of the US military on Okinawa, including major returns of land, such as the northern training area. Meanwhile, the defense guideline review between the US and Japan led to a new US-Japan agreement to cooperate on situations in the area surrounding Japan that have a direct impact on the security of Japan, the so-called so Chuhen Chitai. Um, this is what Nixon had wanted 25 early, years earlier, but never achieved. As China surpassed Japan to become the second largest economy in the world, increased Chinese military spending by close to 20% per year over the next 25 years, engaged in coercion around the Senkakus in the South China Sea and against Taiwan, the US-Japan alliance moved forward even further from the 1998 defense guidelines and Shuhen Jitai. When the Abe government determined that Japan would exercise the right of collective self-defense 
He unlocked the door to joint planning for regional contingencies for the first time. He permanently removed the alibi that Japanese leaders had used to pretend that they had no idea about or no involvement in U.S. military decision making involving uh, U.S. bases and particularly deployments of U.S. military forces from uh, U.S. bases in Japan. In this new area, era, since um, uh, Prime Minister Abe passed security legislation and recognized Japan's right of collective self-defense, in this new area, Japanese leaders um, will be held accountable for the alliance, and the United States will be more dependent on Japan as our bilateral planning deepens. This is now a true alliance in almost every dimension on the security side. But while Japan has increased its contribution to security, has, in, has reduced the burden of the U.S. to provide security in this region, has moved towards a more capable uh, and, and, and interoperable alliance. Um, the other side of the recalibration, the reduction of the burden, um, the people of Okinawa has not moved forward with the same success, um, although there have been some successes. While the media put a spotlight uh, on a dissenting piece by a colleague at CSIS, an opinion piece um, written by one of my colleagues that said Futenma relocation facility would never be completed. Um, that's not what I think. And um, that's not based on research, this opinion that uh, Futenma will never be finished. Um, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I work, was asked by the US Congress uh, twice uh, in the past 10 years to examine U.S. forward military presence in Japan and particularly in Okinawa. Um, and after extensive research, um, our scholars concluded that despite the difficulties, despite the friction, the Futema relocation plan is still the best of the options available if we are to try to reduce, reduce the burden on Okinawa um, without weakening deterrence. Um, despite what my colleague said, the implementation of the plan with fits and starts and, 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 and of course friction is moving forward. Um, and when former Prime Minister Hatsuya Miyukio uh, said that he would move um, Futema out of Okinawa, the famous Kengai Iten statement, he did that without studying what the options really were and he created an expectation and a confusion. Um, and I think to this day, um, because of the operational realities, Kengaiten moving Futema out of Okinawa completely is not, uh, is not going to be feasible. Um, but I do think there are many uh, ways that the U.S. and Japan can demonstrate flexibility, uh, be proactive, demonstrate agility, and find ways to reduce the operational tempo, to reduce noise, to reduce the, um, the dangers and the um, associated problems with bases. Um, and we really are in an era where it's incumbent on the United States um, and the US military and uh, the US government and the Japanese government to explore those options. Um, even if Kengaiten, moving uh, the Futema Marine Corps Air Station completely out of Okinawa yeah, is not a practical option at this point. I actually looked at this in 1998 uh, on a research trip to Okinawa. Um, I spent about five days talking to uh, mayors and political figures and then spent several days talking to the U.S. base commanders. Um, and uh, my trip was an independent trip um, but I reported back to the Pentagon what I thought in my own personal capacity. And the idea I proposed was that the Pentagon and the, uh, the United States government consider turning uh, Marine Corps Air Station Futema into a United Nations base, um, a United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees base, commanded by a uh, Japan Air Self-Defense Force colonel flying a UN flag with significantly reduced uh, air operations, and with those air operations focused primarily on humanitarian assistance missions, with helicopters distributed to other locations. Um, and indeed, if we had had such a UNHCR 
humanitarian relief base in 2004 when the massive tsunami struck the Indian, struck the Indian Ocean, it would have been enormously helpful to people across the entire region. Now, the deterrence mission and regional security and Japan's security still mattered. So what I proposed was that um, in a contingency uh, in Korea or Taiwan or the region, uh, Futenma would surge its operations. Um, so this was just one idea. It was my own personal idea. Um, uh, the Pentagon didn't like it. I don't think the Japanese uh, government was ready to move forward either. But there are other ways and other ideas that we should creatively put forward to um, distribute uh, the operations of Futema and reduce the burden. Um, the bottom line, it seems to me, is that no matter what further measures can be taken uh, to reduce um, uh, the burden of operations, there will have to be a US uh, Marine Corps air station. But we can find ways to distribute um, uh, the burden placed on the people of Okinawa, and we should do so um, through dialogue and candid listening. In that context, I was very impressed with Ambassador Rahm Emanuel's uh, visit to Okinawa recently. He spent four days. Uh, he's from Chicago, and people from Chicago have a reputation for talking a lot, but Ambassador Emanuel listened. He listened to the governor, he listened to the mayors, um, he listened to them first and heard their perspectives, and then he talked to the U.S. base commanders instead of doing it the other way around. And um, uh, l last night, Japan time, this morning, uh, Washington, D.C. time, I hosted Ambassador Emmanuel at CSIS uh, with Ambassador uh, Tomita Koji from Japan, uh, ambassador in Washington, and he talked about his trip and he talked about Okinawa. And he emphasized that he is working with the Biden administration to find uh, creative ways to reduce the burden on the Okinawan people uh, as the United States and Japan refresh uh, our forward military presence in a new strategic environment. Um, the US Marine Corps, the US Army are looking at a more distributed presence, a more agile presence, smaller units able to move around. There will still have to be core bases and core operating platforms, including for uh, the Marine Corps Air Wing. Um, but we're in a different strategic environment, and Ambassador Emanuel signaled, I thought, pretty clearly that he's going to work with the Biden administration to look at ways to help local officials um, reduce um, the burden they face from U.S. operations, and uh, also, importantly, to look at how the U.S., for our part, can contribute in a very dynamic way to economic development uh, in Okinawa. So this is exactly the kind of proactive and inclusive and frankly consultative approach that's key to winning support. There are a lot of stakeholders and a lot of actors involved in this um, process. You have the US military, the State Department, the Pentagon civilian leadership, the White House, Tokyo, Naha, business, local communities, mayors. Um, uh, only with the kind of proactive listening and dialogue that I think Ambassador Emanuel demonstrated are we going to make progress. At the same time, I think we have to be realistic that the geopolitical pressures on Japan security, especially in the East China Sea, especially around Okinawa, uh, are increasing. Um, by way of historical context, when we were negotiating SACO in the 1990s, North Korea barely had any missiles that were capable of hitting Japan. Today, Pyongyang boasts hundreds of missiles capable of hitting Japan, with chemical and biological and presumably now nuclear warheads. Uh, and indeed, if you're following North Korean developments, most experts think that Pyongyang is preparing to resume nuclear tests and ICBM tests and possibly hypersonic missile tests. Uh, the government of Moon Jae-in in Korea, um, which is in its last week in office, tried everything possible with North Korea. Reassurance, diplomacy, proposing peace treaties, proposing end of war declarations. Many around the world thought the Moon Jae-in government was going too far, it was appeasing Kim Jong-un. Um, but the Biden administration supported Seoul's efforts, um, as did Japan. Um, they did not work. Uh, 
So the North Korean threat is clearly more of a challenge, far more of a challenge than it has ever been to Japan. And then, of course, China, as I mentioned. China is expanding its military pressure not only on the first island chain, but increasingly on the second island chain and beyond to the Pacific Islands in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Solomon Islands and the Pacific Islands uh, reached an agreement with Beijing on security cooperation, and many experts in the U.S. and Australia and Japan are concerned that China will start building military bases in the South Pacific. China's already working on dual-use military bases in the Indian Ocean. And Xi Jinping makes little secret of his desire to displace the United States as the predominant power in the Indo-Pacific, to be able to dictate to countries like Japan uh, the outcome of disagreements over territory, over trade, over technology, and to do so from a position of strength and coercion. And that's precisely why the strengthening of the U.S.-Japan alliance and also the U.S.-Japan-India-Australia Quad uh, and new initiatives like the U.S.-U.K.-Australia AUKUS framework are necessary to demonstrate to China that the maritime democracies, above all Japan, will not allow uh, coercion and intimidation um, to pave a path for China's ambitions for hegemony. And I think the election of Yun suk yeol in Korea means that increasingly now South Korea will also stand with the United States and Japan and Australia and others for a free and open Indo-Pacific, as will many European powers that are now awakening to the challenge they sit face as China um, supports, at least diplomatically, um, Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. And this brutal and illegal um, and horrific invasion uh, and, 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 and massacres of civilians and indiscriminate bombing of civilian targets by Vladimir Putin of Russia uh, in Ukraine, it only adds more clarity to the challenges we face. Many of us assumed that before Putin attacked, he would rattle his saber to intimidate Ukraine, but he would not go across the line and try a full-scale invasion of a free country and a free people. But he crossed that line. And in now, in the most dangerous and reprehensible way we could imagine. And as a result, many experts are now questioning whether perhaps we are underestimating Xi Jinping's own appetite for risk and conflict. Uh, I have long felt that Xi's gray zone strategy depends on signaling that he is prepared to take greater risk than the United States or Japan or Taiwan. Uh, when Xi Jinping met with Putin for a full day before the Winter Olympics, Putin promised that the attack on Ukraine would be quick and successful, and he clearly had Xi's blessing. Now China is in a very difficult position, flustered that Russia is failing on the battlefield which puts Japan, uh, excuse me, which puts China in, in an awkward diplomatic position and creates the risk now of regime change in Moscow because Putin is failing so badly. This is not something Beijing wants to see. The collapse of Putin's Russia would leave Xi Jinping alone. He, he wants and needs authoritarian partners. But at the same time, the unexpected failures of the Russian military and the incredible courage, resilience, and um, innovation of the Ukrainian forces must be causing China to really reconsider whether Beijing could use force effectively to somehow reunify uh, Taiwan through force. And yet at the same time, China continues increasing military, diplomatic, and economic pressure on Taiwan. And indeed, Beijing's leaders may look at what happened in Ukraine and conclude that the biggest failure of Putin was to telegraph for so many months that an invasion was possible. And it is, it is quite conceivable that the Chinese conclusion will be that a sudden sneak attack is the way to use force. So we cannot rest easy, even though the failure of Russia in Ukraine will complicate China's planning. The cross-strait situation today is more dangerous than it has been for decades, even if the chance of an outright Chinese invasion remains low. The Ukraine crisis has also awakened the democratic nations to the fragility of our way of life and the need for solidarity and greater defense spending. Germany is increasing defense spending dramatically. Sweden and Finland, which preferred neutrality, are likely to give up that neutrality and join NATO because of the Russian threat. And NATO now is increasing its collaboration with Japan, with Australia, and with Korea as alliances in Asia and Europe realize that 
the threat to the international order and to our way of life uh, is not limited to any one region. And it is very clear that Japan is also awakening to this new reality, and not only awakening to the reality of these challenges, but leading in preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific and a liberal international order. The Kishida government has stood strongly with the G7 countries to hold Putin accountable, uh, abandoning diplomacy pursued by Mr. Abe over the Northern Territories. Within the Diet, there's strong support for increasing defense spending, Few are challenging the goal of doubling spending to 2%, and in polls, I think by Yomiuri, a majority of the Japanese support that goal of increasing uh, defense, essentially doubling it to 2% because of the very real and present danger from China and North Korea and the example of what that can mean for free people that we see in Ukraine. Now, the finance ministry and the budget bureau in the finance ministry will probably push back, but there's clearly support in Japan for increasing defense efforts. And we see increasing unity of democratic allies. There are questions I know about the American ability to keep a focus on the Indo-Pacific while resisting Putin's invasion in Ukraine on the other side of the world. Uh, these criticisms include questions about whether the US would fight to defend Taiwan or Japan or Korea, since there are no US troops fighting on the ground in Ukraine right now. Others question whether the United States has the bandwidth uh, the resources to handle both NATO and Asia commitments at such a perilous time. I was actually dispatched. I was sent to Taiwan after the Russian invasion by, uh, by, by the White House, by the Biden administration, with another uh, uh, group of, uh, with, together with a group of senior U.S. officials. And we, we went to Taipei. We met with the leaders in, in, in Taipei, Tsai Ing-wen and the leader of the opposition and others. And we explained that the United States is fully committed to defense and security in the Western Pacific, even as we respond to the challenge in Ukraine. And we made several points that I would amplify now uh, to you. First, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. And the clear opportunity presented by Ukraine, as I noted, is to signal to China and North Korea that not just US allies in Asia, but US allies around the world, including in Europe, will rally when free people are attacked, just as the Japanese government Australia, Korea, Singapore rallied to help Europe when Putin attacked Ukraine. This global, global solidarity of democracies is a powerful uh, factor that will complicate China's uh, ambitions and any consideration of the use of force. Second, it's worth noting that President Biden is traveling to Japan and Korea in two weeks in the midst of this Ukraine crisis precisely to demonstrate his personal commitment uh, to the Indo-Pacific and to hear from Prime Minister Kishida about Japan's strategy and what Japan needs of the United States. Uh, third, I expect that the United States will increase our own defense spending to deal with the dual threats presented by China and Russia. In the U.S. midterm elections in November, most experts believe the Republicans, the opposition party, will win the House of Representatives away from the Democrats and possibly the Senate as well. Historically, when the Republicans win the House, they always increase defense spending. But even if they don't win uh, and the Democrats manage to squeeze out a narrow victory somehow uh, in the midterm elections in November, uh, I think the Biden administration will ask for increases in defense spending, which will allow the U.S. to um, fulfill its obligations to both allies in Asia and allies in Europe. And fourth, the American public strongly supports defending Japan. All the public opinion polls show that American support for the defense of Japan and Korea and Taiwan is the highest it's ever been. Uh, the U.S. commitment to Japan is based on a mutual security treaty ratified by the U.S. Congress, strongly supported by the American people. We have no such security treaty with Ukraine. And yet the Biden administration is imposing unprecedented sanctions on Russia, despite Russian uh, hints and threats of nuclear uh, war. And the Biden administration is prioritizing, above all other legislation right now, uh, the so-called Lend-Lease Act to provide hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons, artillery, surface-to-surface uh, -surface missiles, and so forth, that will help Ukraine defeat Putin's deadly ambition. Uh, the U.S. is taking risk, considerable risk, to support the people of Ukraine. If anything, the Russian attack on Ukraine has increased American support for defending close allies and increasing defense spending. Now, I know that even these points will not completely reassure Japan. They didn't reassure Taiwan completely or other U.S. allies. Uh, 
President Biden in Japan will announce the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, um, which is supposed to be an economic uh, uh, initiative to fill the vacuum left when the United States withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, now called the CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. And when President Biden announces the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, I think most observers are going to say it is very insufficient to fill the gap left by the U.S. withdrawal from TPP. So uh, the Biden administration has to do more, there's no doubt about it, to demonstrate that uh, American leadership will not just be in the diplomatic and military realms, but in the economic rulemaking realm. And Japan has, uh, under Abe and Suga and now Kishida, stepped up to lead on economic rulemaking, but cannot do it without the U.S. And without economic progress and without economic rules, um, this region will be more vulnerable to disruptions and stability and coercion by um, authoritarian states. There's also this important question of how do we live with China? Uh, there's broad consensus in the U.S. and Japan and elsewhere, frankly, that we have to do more to deter China from trying to use force. But we also need China for tourism, for help on climate change, for help on North Korea, uh, for trade. Uh, when we conducted surveys at CSIS recently, um, only 20% of the American people, 20% of the Japanese people, uh, supported decoupling or, or, or containing China. Uh, we need to live with China, as difficult as Beijing has become. So what kind of diplomacy? I, I saw that recently Governor Tamaki called for more diplomacy with China. And the governor is right. Diplomacy is critical. And the US and Japan need to find a framework to reduce the risk of conflict with China and to build cooperation where we can. And in many respects, um, the Biden administration's new Indo-Pacific strategy lacks, lacks any vision for how the US uh, sees a long-term relationship with China. Um, but Japan uh, consistently refers to that. The recent LDP um, national security strategy that was issued about a week ago, in the very first page, notes that uh, Japan um, seeks a productive relationship with China. So I think Kishida-san is going to have to talk to Joe Biden about not only competing with China, pushing back against Chinese coercion, but what is our vision for long-term um, peace and stability and a productive relationship with China. As difficult as that will be in the near term and the medium term, we have to have that vision for the future. The governor of Okinawa is right about that. However, we also have to clearly recognize that we are in far more perilous times than we have faced for many, many decades. And diplomacy has to complement defense and deterrence. It cannot replace defense and deterrence. It never, never in the history of the world has diplomacy successfully replaced defense and deterrence and achieve peace. You need both. But there's no doubt that the U.S. has to be thinking more seriously with Japan about what our diplomatic approach will be with China. So what can be done for Okinawa at this time of growing geopolitical pressure on the East China Sea and the immediate region immediately around Okinawa? And yet at a time when the people of Okinawa rightly expect more from Tokyo and more from Washington to reduce the burden. Uh, there's no doubt the entire world owes Okinawa a debt of gratitude for contributing to stability in this part of the world. Um, even if many Okinawans did not voluntarily uh, agree to accept that burden, we nevertheless, in the United States, in Japan, and indeed the Indo-Pacific region as a whole, uh, owe oh, 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 appreciation and thanks to the people of Okinawa. At the same time, if the U.S. were to suddenly withdraw bases from Okinawa, I can assure you there would be a massive vacuum at the heart of Asia. China would rapidly seek to fill that vacuum. North Korea would exploit the friction. And there would be alarm, alarm and crisis in Australia, in Korea, and even as far away uh, as Europe. Um, and yet at the same time, if we ignore uh, the expectations of the people of Okinawa and if friction and disharmony grows in Okinawa because of U.S. bases, this could also create a crisis of uncertainty. Uh, I, I remember after the Okinawa crisis in 1995,
prompted by this unforgivable uh, rape, um, that in that moment of uncertainty, I was visited in, in my office in Washington by ambassadors and diplomats from countries like Singapore, Korea, Australia, Great Britain, France, and India, and they all asked the same question. Will the U.S. withdraw from Okinawa? Will the U.S. withdraw its bases? They all saw U.S. military presence in the first island chain in Japan, and particularly in the geopolitically crucial uh, Okinawa uh, region, as essential to their own security. So we have to keep that in mind uh, as well. The first and most important thing, as I noted at the outset, is to strengthen candid and discreet dialogue. The pipe between the Kante and Tokyo and Okinawa has been strong sometimes, weak sometimes. You know, when my friend um, Okamoto Yukio was, was advising prime ministers, the pipe was strong. He advised everyone from Kajiyama to Suga. Um, I don't know that it's so strong right now. Um, Washington and Tokyo also need senior officials who are responsible for finding proactive ways to uh, communicate with uh, uh, Okinawa and look for ways to reduce the burden and contribute in a dynamic way to economic development. And to find quick solutions to problems around bases, and around bases, not let them fester. And Ambassador Emanuel really, I thought, took a first important step in that regard. And it's my hope that with trust, uh, there will be opportunities for more creative and bigger initiatives. On the other hand, if the dialogue keeps becoming litigious, confrontational, then it will be harder to be creative, to be dynamic, and to be proactive, and to address the aspirations of the people of Okinawa uh, and, and the security of Japan and the Indo-Pacific. So it's my hope as I conclude that we can all use this 50th anniversary uh, of reversion and this important conference sponsored by, uh, by Yomiri and our dialogue, and I look forward to your questions, it's my hope we can use all of this to rekindle that kind of dynamic, proactive, uh, and trusting effort uh, to make this region secure, prosperous, and to uh, bring back uh, to Okinawa all of the dynamic, uh, cultural, economic, um, and um, exciting aspects of what your beautiful, beautiful beaches and towns and resorts and cities and culture offer to the world as well. So with that, uh, Keiko, thank you, and I look forward to the questions and discussion. Mike, uh, Green -san. Mike, uh, Dr. Green, thank you very much. Uh, from the history up until the reality uh, today, uh, as we think about the 50th anniversary uh, of uh, reversion of Okinawa to Japan, it was a highly enlightening as well as educating presentation. Washington, it is past midnight, so it's very, very late uh, in the night, and uh, I appreciate uh, the energy and stamina of uh, Dr. Green. And on Washington time, up until 1 a.m., he will remain uh, to receive questions. Uh, we are indeed very grateful. There are already many questions received from the audience in advance, and I had prepared questions myself, but there are so many. And mostly, it is to do with the one same topic, China's possible invasion of Taiwan is the risk getting larger, or is it smaller today? Because of Ukraine, how high a risk, how great a risk would you envisage for possible invasion by PRC into Taiwan? And then the U.S. forces in Japan, their bases in Okinawa, how large and important a role to be played by those U.S. forces base in Okinawa. Now, the risk of a PRC invasion, if we would take the possible risk level up until last year as 100, what would be the numerical value would you attach for today? Do you think the risk is greater or do you think that the risk level is lower? <laughs> 
smaller. So this is my first question, or everybody's question, actually. Well, the risk is greater. Um, and you can see why when we are witnessing um, regular PLA Air Force incursions into Taiwan's air defense zone. For decades, um, PRC, PLA Air Force fighters and bombers would not cross a midway point between the mainland and Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait. But now, regularly, you have major Chinese um, uh, air combatants crossing that line, bombers, fighters. Um, you have uh, PLA Navy ships regularly circumnavigating Taiwan. Um, you have constant cyber warfare. Um, the so-called gray zone conflict between uh, Taiwan and, and China is already happening as um, the Chinese side tries to um, infiltrate uh, cyberspace in Taiwan, tries to use social media to turn uh, the Taiwan people against the government. Um, when I was in Taiwan um, uh, with other former officials representing uh, the, the Biden administration, um, our trip was being attacked in social media. And um, many of those attacks were um, from the mainland. Um, some of them were from Taiwan, but through proxies of the mainland. So the reality is uh, Taiwan is already struggling uh, for democracy in the face of unprecedented military, um, uh, technological, cyber, and economic pressures, including boycotts. And um, for that reason alone, we have to consider that the uh, danger of, uh, uh, of a conflict in the Taiwan Strait is higher than it was just a few years ago. And then on top of that, you look at the Ukraine crisis and you realize that perhaps we don't know how to judge how much risk an authoritarian leader like Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping is really willing to taste to take. We guessed wrong about Putin. Overwhelmingly, experts thought Putin would take a risk and rattle his saber, but not risk all out war. So we, we have to be realistic that we don't know really um, how far Xi Jinping would, would go. Um, however, I, I think that the, the even if the danger of war is higher, it's still very low. Um, and there are two lessons from Ukraine that are very powerful that we heard in Taipei when I was there that, that can make the Taiwan Strait more secure. Um, the first is the people of Taiwan saw that the people of Ukraine could withstand an invasion. And remember, the Russians were invading from across land, not across the ocean. Um, uh, the Chinese military would have to cross the Kaiwan Strait. The Russians were invading from their border directly into Ukraine, or from Belarus directly into Ukraine. But China would have to invade by going through sea lanes and, 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 and air, uh, uh, air corridors where the United States and Japan have major forces. Um, and so, you know, it's a much more difficult challenge in many respects. Uh, than Putin faced. And the Ukrainian people showed the Taiwanese people that if you can resist, yeah. the world will rally to your help. And so it's been interesting that a significant majority of the Taiwanese public say they would fight to defend their, their democracy. And the government uh, of Tsai Ing-wen is looking at ways to learn the lessons from Ukraine's success on the battlefield. Um, and uh, instead of just buying uh, fighter jets and submarines that, that might try to stop uh, uh, a Chinese invasion out at sea, um, uh, the Tsai government is now trying to emphasize more what we would call territorial defense. Um, the ability to turn Taiwan's very rugged uh, topography, caves and hills and steep valleys, tough weather, to turn that into a, an advantage to be able to, to fight, to use surface-to-surface -surface missiles, mines, to survive and mm -hmm. defy any invasion. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that is what Taiwan is increasingly doing. And uh, that will complicate 
uh, Chinese assumptions about how easily um, they could grab Taiwan. And then the other lesson, which is very powerful, mm. is that um, the international community and the major democracies um, matter. Um, mm. Deterrence is not just a matter of military power, it's a matter of economic power and geopolitics. Mm. And the success that the Biden administration has had with enormous help from Japan, mm. building a global coalition of the most powerful economies in Europe and in Asia and in North America, to impose a crushing punishment on Vladimir Putin, and a long-term punishment in terms of economic interests and diplomatic interests, that surprised Putin. And it definitely surprised Xi Jinping. So the lesson we heard when we were in Taiwan is, Taiwan needs not just the US, not just Japan, but Europe. And Europe may not send military forces. Um, I think US and Japan would, would almost certainly be confronted with military uh, challenges and, and decisions if China used force, and probably Australia, and maybe a few others like Canada or Britain. Um, I don't think Germany or France or the Netherlands would necessarily send forces, even if they're in um, in the Pacific for economic reasons. But mm. but they could impose a major cost on China economically. And it is true that China is more intertwined with the global economy, and that we all depend more on China for our economic growth than we do Russia. But I still believe that the Ukraine crisis showed that free people in strong economies are willing to take some pain to punish authoritarian, authoritarian states for aggression. So that, that, that is another factor. The first is turn Taiwan into a porcupine, make it too hard for China to swallow. That's a lesson from Ukraine. And the second is there's a global coalition that could be formed quite quickly from Europe to Asia to impose a punishing cost on China should it use force. We need to keep building up both of those things uh, to ensure that Beijing doesn't think about using force. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, it, it almost goes without saying that the U.S.-Japan alliance is the most important basis mm -hmm. uh, for stability in uh, the Indo-Pacific, including in the Taiwan Strait. And if the U.S. and Japan are, if we're doing our homework, if we're exercising our forces, if we're building and buying the right equipment, if we're sharing intelligence um, and increasing our uh, defense efforts, um, uh, that will really be an enormous obstacle to any Chinese use of force. Even though um, uh, the United States and Japan have no treaty obligation to defend Taiwan, the, the United States has an obligation to defend Japan under the um, 1960 Mutual Security Treaty. Um, in the case of Taiwan, um, our a security commitment rests on legislation on the so-called Taiwan Relations Act, which states that the United States will provide Taiwan with articles for its defense, and also states that any attack on Taiwan would be seen as a severe threat to U.S. interests. Um, in other words, it's, it's, it's more ambiguous, so-called strategic ambiguity, than the commitment to Japan. But I think there's little doubt that the American and Japanese people would see an attack on Taiwan as a direct threat to mm -hmm. our interests. Indeed, it's difficult for me to see how China would use military force against Taiwan without confronting also Japan and the United States. So um, that is uh, complicated, but especially for China. Uh, it's becoming harder and harder for China to think of a way that it can cut off Taiwan, seize Taiwan, without somehow tripping uh, into the United States, Japan, and now with Ukraine, we can see the entire uh, democratic world. So, Keiko, yes, it's more dangerous. If, a, if it was 100 two years ago, it's 110 or 120 now, but, um, but not imminent and not um, as dangerous as some in the media think because of the factors I've mentioned. And the opportunities, some of them illustrated from what we see in Ukraine, to really make it difficult for China to contemplate force. Thank you very much, Dr. Green, for that response. Appreciate it. Yes, indeed. I think there are two takeaways or lessons in relation to the Ukraine. Militarily speaking, 
invasion, aggression into Taiwan is more challenging compared to the situation in Ukraine because you have to you have to navigate across the sea, the ocean. The other element is that if you want to challenge against the democracy, if you want to change force, if we want to change the status quo through force, then you will be confronted with international community response. The international community will be united in response to such an aggression. You're going to be contained. You're going to be surrounded by the international community. So these are the two takeaways. Now, we have received some questions from the audience, many questions from the audience. So it's a related question. The United States has taken strategic ambivalence in addressing Taiwan. U.S. has intentionally been somewhat ambiguous when it comes to Taiwan. But isn't it time that the strategic ambivalence and ambiguity be made clear by the United States? That is the question. Isn't it, for example, shouldn't the United States draw a clear red line beyond which U.S. will indeed respond? Will the, United, will the, US, will the U.S. take such policy? Can you give a brief response to this question? Should the U.S. become more clear? Thank you. Dr. Green. Thank you. I, I know that former Prime Minister Abe um, said it's time for strategic clarity to move away from the U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity, a policy where the U.S. doesn't say whether it would or would not uh, intervene in a Taiwan crisis. Um, but I don't think the Biden administration is going to, um, going to uh, move towards strategic clarity, and I, I don't think it's very likely that a, a future administration would do so either, or that the Congress would really support it. Um, and the reason is that um, uh, what, you know, you have to ask, what is strategic clarity? The U.S. Mm -hmm. has strategic clarity about the defense of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, every president since Clinton has clarified publicly that Article 5 of the Security Treaty applies to the Senkakus. Mm -hmm. And even without that clarification, the United States Senate ratified uh, a treaty in 1960 pledging American uh, defense of Japan. Mm. Um, we don't have a treaty with, with Taiwan, so how do you do strategic clarity? The reason there's strategic clarity with Japan is because we have a security treaty. Mm -hmm. I don't think a defense treaty with Taiwan could get through the U.S. Congress. Um, and so that's one reason why I think strategic clarity, at least mm -hmm. as we know it with Japan, is, is likely. Uh, the other factor is, as I mentioned, one of the most important um, deterrents for China is that the international community will rally to Taiwan's help if China uses force unilaterally against Taiwan. And indeed, in the last year, we have seen the Biden administration successfully, again with Japan's key, key leadership, successfully include references to Taiwan and the, and the security of the Taiwan Strait, uh, unprecedented references to Taiwan, in the U.S.-EU summit, in the U.S.-Korea summit, in the G7 summit. So the U.S. has, with Japan's help, um, built international diplomatic support for um, uh, not Taiwanese uh, independence, uh, not diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but for Taiwan's security, for Taiwan's democracy, for um, opposing use of force against Taiwan. These are very powerful reminders to Beijing that it would face an enormous international backlash uh, from the leading economies of the world if it used force. But I can tell you that if the U.S. had been proposing strategic clarity, mm -hmm. it would have been much more difficult to get the European Union, to get Korea, mm -hmm. uh, to get the G7 countries mm -hmm. to agree to these statements of um, uh, support for Taiwan security. So there would be a big trade-off. This is the second reason why I think strategic clarity is not, uh, not likely. Um, but the third reason I think we probably won't move to strategic clarity um, is because we don't need to. There are very many ways to demonstrate that the U.S. and U.S. allies um, will uh, be able to effectively respond to any Chinese threat or use of force. Um, and we can do that by strengthening U.S.-Japan contingency planning and exercises, which we are doing. Mm -hmm. We can do that by declaring more clearly um, uh, that uh, any attack by China 
would represent a grave threat to our interests, mm -hmm. which of course is language from the Taiwan Relations Act. We can demonstrate support by expediting uh, the weapons systems that Taipei needs mm -hmm. um, to uh, follow the Ukrainian example. There are a lot of things we can do without changing our one China policy mm -hmm. or without requiring a treaty to be ratified in the US Congress and the Senate. There are a lot of things we can do to demonstrate that the US is um, uh, committed to opposing unilateral force against Taiwan. Um, uh, I, I don't think, uh, finally, the fourth reason I don't think you'll have strategic clarity is because um, th there's a concern in Washington that we cannot give a blank check uh, to Taipei. Tsai Ing-wen, the current president, is a remarkably strategic, reliable, and um, wise leader. But who knows who will lead Taiwan in five years? And so I think the fourth reason, which you sometimes hear in Washington, is we, we can't give a blank check to Taiwan. But all of that said, mm -hmm. you are seeing remarkable public, especially congressional support for Taiwan security. Um, and increasingly from Europe, from Australia, and of course from Japan. Um, uh, and so much so that in Taiwan, in public opinion polls, the Taiwanese people think that Japan is going to save Taiwan, not the U.S. So there are many, many ways to ramp up and demonstrate clarity of support for Taiwan and a readiness and a willingness to resist um, uh, Chinese aggression without going to full strategic clarity. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, strategic and clarity in some sense means and sometimes means uh, something not good. I think that's what you have pointed out. Well, putting this aside, my personal view is that uh, President uh, Biden has uh, clear, uh, has stated that there will be no troops to be sent to Ukraine. A clear statement, and I think that is a part of uh, strategic clarity. And that uh, uh, failed uh, in some sense. Just one word uh, from uh, Mr. Green. Uh, any comment on this? The failure of uh, strategic clarity in terms of Ukraine. So, are you asking Keiko if the U.S. should have promised that it would send troops in to defend Ukraine? So they are not there. No, uh, there should be some strategic ambiguity. It should be kept. Uh, nothing to be mentioned in this regard, uh, so far as uh, it will maintain strategic uh, ambiguity. And, and then that the Putin was encouraged uh, to make uh, aggression because of uh, the promise by President Biden uh, not to send uh, troops. Uh, but there are many other questions. So just one comment from you. Yeah, I don't think that... Um I, I don't think that, uh, that President Biden saying he wouldn't send troops to Ukraine um, was a green light for Putin to invade. I don't think uh, NATO expected the U.S. or any NATO country to send troops on the ground in Ukraine, and I don't think Putin expected it. And I think um, we have to remember that um, since 2014, when Putin uh, invaded Crimea, uh, the U.S. and Canada in particular were training the Ukrainian troops. The fighting you see successful fighting by Ukrainian troops, that's, that's American and Canadian training. Um, and also the administration released the intelligence about, about uh, Russians' um, uh, preparations. So I think they did everything they could to try to deter and dissuade Putin. If Biden had said, we will put boots on the ground, we will send troops to Ukraine, um, it would have divided NATO and it would have divided the American public. Remember, uh, the United States is a democracy, and the, and the American public was not ready to do that. Um, and even today, um, a majority of Americans don't think we should have troops in Ukraine. But 80 percent or more in the polls strongly support um, the Biden administration's provision of lots and lots, hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons, sharing intelligence, rallying the international community, community to punish Putin. That's all possible because President Biden read the American public properly. If he had said, we'll put boots on the ground, there would have been a huge debate in Congress, would have been divisive in NATO, probably would have made it easier for Putin to try to divide the international community. Um, so that, that's my answer to your question on, on, on that one.
わかりました。ありがとうございます。あ、そしてあのえっ、ー、と続きの質問なんですけれども。There is a follow-up question about the Japanese defense budget. Dr. Green, you also mentioned in your presentation. Right now, of the GDP ratio, more than one percent within the LDP, it should be made greater. That is the recommendation from the LDP Commission on Security. Of course, there is a long history for the defense budget. It used to be less than one percent of the GNP. For many, many decades, but because of the security development surrounding Japan becoming much severer, it should be at least the two percent. So the recommendation that has been given by the LDP. So with、uh, Japan increasing its defense budget, what is your view? What is your take, Dr. Green? This. this is the question. Well, I, I think two percent of GDP is a reasonable number for Japan. <laughs>、um, on a per capita basis, Japanese defense spending is about the same as small Caribbean islands like Bermuda or Barbados, which face almost no military threat on a per capita basis. So, two percent of GDP, <coughs> excuse me, two percent of GDP defense spending would still be below the U.S., Korea, Australia. Um, and many NATO countries, so it strikes me as a very reasonable goal. And the LDP has proposed to do it in five years.、Um, it, it won't be easy. That that means that means doubling to、um, uh, over 100 billion U.S. dollars a year the defense budget.、Um, and uh, it is uh, striking that within the Diet and within the LDP, there's broad support for this. The public, the majority of the public, supports it. But it's going to be、um, a challenge to, 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 to create that budget and increase the size of government spending、um, as Japan deals with debt and other pressures from an aging society.、Um, but I do hope that this is、uh, a proposal that becomes reality, because ultimately the, the goal of government is to protect the people's way of life, and the Japanese people's way of life is under、uh, increasing pressure and challenge from. Chinese military modernization from North Korea、um, and other challenges, and two、uh, percent is a reasonable amount that would put Japan in line with other U.S. allies in Europe and Asia, but still below them, honestly.、Uh, Australia, Korea, Germany—they're all increasing their defense spending. They're all going to go over two percent,、uh, well over two percent for Korea and Australia and the U.S. So, some people are arguing two percent is not enough, but I'd say it's a good goal, and I hope it's realized. はい、えー、ありがとうございます。あのー、Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Now, with regard to the U.S. forces in Okinawa, of all the forces in Japan, 70% of the U.S. forces in Japan are concentrated in Okinawa. 70% is concentrated in Okinawa. If we are to reduce or realign this situation, then As far as the U.S. government is concerned, wouldn't that demotivate U.S. forces from protecting Japan if the U.S. forces in Okinawa were to be reduced? That's the question from the floor. Any response from your side? We haven't talked very much about nuclear weapons, but the reality is North Korea is expanding its nuclear arsenal.、Uh, according to the Pentagon's report, China will、um, increase four times, four times. The size of its nuclear, strategic nuclear forces in the next decade, and Russia is threatening nuclear war、uh, in Europe. But of course, Russia has nuclear weapons in the Far East that threaten Japan. So,、um, the U.S. extended deterrence, the so-called nuclear umbrella, is more important than ever for Japan、mm -hmm. and other allies. And what makes the U.S. extended deterrent credible? It's the fact that there are American troops on the ground. That any attack on Japan. Uh, would automatically mean killing Americans,、um, and mean that it would be also an attack on the United States. So, the premise of the question is exactly right. The U.S. military presence is the indispensable、uh, root and trunk of a credible nuclear umbrella.、Um, the nuclear umbrella would be less credible without that presence.
Um, I would also add that, um, well, I would also uh, reiterate what I said in my presentation, that the geographic location of Okinawa in the midst of this geopolitical competition makes it more important than ever as a base of operations for Japan's forces and U.S. forces to protect the free and open Indo-Pacific and to deter and, if necessary, defeat uh, any use of force in the East China Sea uh, or in Northeast Asia. And to be able to operate effectively in this environment, the, uh, the, the U.S. and Japan need runways. We need airfields. We need as many as we can get, to be honest. So um, getting rid of runways, getting rid of airfields is not a strategy that will work. And that's one of the reasons why I think for Tema replacement um, is essential. Um, there, 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 there needs to be um, uh, not just the fraternal replacement, but as many airfields as possible to be prepared for contingency. But at the same time, as I was suggesting in my presentation, the Marine Corps and the Army are moving towards smaller, more mobile um, deployments and operational concepts mm -hmm. to um, get small units, and Japan's defense forces are doing the same thing, to get small units on, on small islands, uh, around the first island chain um, to uh, defeat uh, Chinese maneuvers with surface-to-surface -surface missiles. So the whole concept of the Marine Corps and Army is moving towards smaller unit deployments and more agile unit deployments. That will take some time, but I think it must inevitably um, also mean that large-scale maneuvers um, and, and large-scale exercises are not necessary in the same way. Mm -hmm. And there, I would think, when we see what the plans are, I would think there would be some um, new opportunity for flexibility and reducing some of the operational uh, uh, tempo and some of the noise and the uh, danger associated with military exercises. Because what the military will do is going to change over the coming years to deal with the nature of the threat. And in that opportunity, I think um, the US and Japanese governments should look to see with Okinawa's uh, leaders what we can do what we can do to, to reduce even further the burden uh, that's born, while moving into a new era where the security of the region is enhanced by new operational concepts. I'm not talking about giving up on FTEMA. We need runways to be able to operate in this new environment. But we don't have to have the same level of exercises and operations necessarily, and, and that's something worth watching. Thank you very much. I believe uh, we are running out of time, so that was the last question and answer. Under the present Biden administration, Dr. Green had, has uh, reflected upon uh, what would be the policy going forward as well in his answers. Uh, President Putin had, has heightened uh, the possibility and threat of the nuclear at uh, the war. Uh, which is relevant not only to Europe, but this is also a wake-up call for Asia as well. So the importance of uh, a Japan-U.S. alliance is even greater because of that. On the other hand, as Dr. Green has emphasized, in order to lessen the impact on Okinawa uh, because of U.S. forces in Japan, I personally believe that Okinawa and uh, the central government needs to communicate better and even deeper, which has been suggested by Dr. Green himself at the outset of his presentation. Kante and the Okinawa prefectural government needs to have uh, even greater dialogue and debate. That is something very necessary. So Dr. Green, I understand that it is one o'clock in the morning in Washington. It is very, very late in the evening. And thank you very much for very valuable presentation. And good night. Have a good sleep. Thank you. Thank you very much.